I'm Z Louise and I am a visual artist. I work primarily uh, with painting and drawing, um, but I've also done a collaboration uh, for Curiosity Collider that involved projections and a robot. Uh, I'm interested in anatomy and these paintings kind of evolved from an exploration of colors and textures and patterns that you find inside the body. So arteries, organs, um, but as I continue to work with these um, textures, I saw a lot of correlation in nature. I've always been interested in science, it's kind of been my, my two passions. Um, so leaving school, I was thinking, okay, which way am I gonna go? Am I gonna do art or science? And uh, art called to me, I said, I'll do that first for sure at least, and, and see where it goes. I thought I might end up in science afterwards, but uh, I found that I could do both. Um, and really, I think Curiosity Collider is a word that I think is perfect for uh, your organization because that is exactly describes what brings art and science together, is that curiosity. Yeah. Char had suggested she thought it would be really interesting after she had seen my paintings to do a collaboration with a line-following robot. And I had never, uh, I didn't really know what line-following robots were before, so... I wasn't sure what to expect or how my work might fit in with something like that. Uh, I found it a little bit different from, from what I had been doing. Uh, but then as soon as we started brainstorming and she showed me you know, what, what these robots did and then meeting Dan, I got really excited about the project and the possibilities. And what was exciting was that contrast between the kind of organic lines and shapes that I use in my paintings with the more geometric mechanical <laughs> lines that are usually used for line following robots so it was a it was a evolution that was exciting at every step <laughs> i think it is important because they're so often set apart or um, made to be two different worlds when really there are so many similarities and i think it's important to show how um, how artists are scientists and experimenters and researchers and curious about things and wanting to learn and understand our world. Uh, my name is uh, Eric Hofzepka. Uh, I am um, I'm a media artist with a background in philosophy and science, uh, particularly in medical research. And uh, my practice is about uh, sort of finding the intersections between uh, that um, scientific practice and the cultural and artistic uh, sort of relationship to science and technology. Uh, the work here is called Demonstration, um, and uh, the full title is a demonstration of Kauai methodologies, um, sorry, Kauai radiation methodologies. And it's a good example of how I like to combine um, elements from um, the artifacts of science, equipment from science, um, and uh, ideas and approaches from art. So in this case, um, you've got an idea that is about um, the appearance of, uh, you know, a, a UV um, linker and uh, a 3D co-generated art, um, and the, the 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 sort of rainbow colors, the the light colors, the brightness of it, and then what this actually emits, uh, and what light actually emits, which is radiation. So a combination of a scientific uh, uh, kind of idea and something that doesn't really have a, a cultural approach to it, doesn't really have a romantic kind of idea of it, and combining that with uh, an idea that comes from aesthetics, from sort of fashion and visuals. So what is the visual uh, uh, aspect to science? Or what, what does it offer to science by bringing it into a sort of cultural, uh, artistic um, kind of realm? Um, is the collaboration commingling or collusion of, like, between art and science important to you? Why or why not? Definitely, yeah. I feel that um, science itself, which is sort of my institutional background, is in science and in medical research. Um, I feel it's really complemented and really um, it, it really benefits from an interdisciplinary approach. So having an artist come along, having a non-professional, someone who has a naive uh, perspective, uh, having multiple perspectives from different disciplines, I think really helps situate it, make it more accountable, make it uh, a sort of uh, a more, um, a, 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 a better situated practice and, and how it situates itself, for instance, in relation, you have the scientific practice and then the ethical aspect of that or the social repercussions of that. It helps you realize those as you're doing the science. 
Uh, my name is Jeremiah Birnbaum. I'm an artist in Vancouver. I'm a member of the uh, Phantoms in the Front Yard Visual Arts Collective, uh, specializing in, in figurative art in the city, as well as have my own independent practice. So the uh, Tougher Than Leather is uh, kind of a continuation of a series I've been working on where I've been looking at people, people in the kind of hip-hop industry that I grew up listening to. And since, since becoming a father, it's been something I've been reflecting back on and kind of coming in terms with my past and my future and my present. Uh, combining my background as a forensic artist, essentially deconstructing the icon and deconstructing the image that was put forward to the musician. Um, all the musicians that I've selected for this series are, are, are deceased. So looking at them in kind of a post-humorous way and, and depicting them essentially as they would be now as opposed to the, the iconic image of them in, in life. Uh, science is something I use when I'm doing, uh, as I said, I work as a forensic artist, so science is something I actually use when I'm doing my work in that capacity. So there's what's referred to as the Manchester methodology, which is the way I would work if I was doing a skull reconstruction. Um, so essentially starting with the skull and, and building out to a face. This is taking it and working in a deconstructive manner. So I'm taking essentially starting with the face and reducing it back down to the essential elements of what the skull would be. I think it's, it's with anything you take something where you're expanding beyond what you're doing just in your own realm, your own, your own practice. For me, stepping outside of it and, and incorporating my, uh, the skill set and the experience I've gained as a forensic artist, it just pushes me into a new direction of, of my work. It kind of takes it beyond just what I would be doing with uh, just my own practice, essentially. Hi, I'm Julia Madison, and uh, I'm a grad student with UBC Forestry. I work on mycorrhizal networks, and um, I like to make wire. So the work I have here is a prototype. I want to make a bigger version one day, and so I'm inviting feedback. This is a work in progress, but uh, it's uh, mobile that represents a general ecosystem. Uh, so we have like primary producers, so like plants on the top, and then things that eat those things, and then predators or things that eat these guys. Uh, as you go down, and these interactions are competitions. Um, as this one goes down, this one goes up, etc. And the idea is, with a big one and and with certain connections, uh, you can start to manipulate these different species uh, abundances, so you can change how many there are, and uh, see the unpredictability of an ecosystem. So it's kind of about the complexity and unpredictability of ecosystems and the feeling that I get working in ecology of complexity. I guess in this case it's because I'm after a feeling. I'm, I want to communicate and share that feeling of awe and unpredictability and, and complexity and so to me art is a really good mechanism for that it's also just really playful uh, and I like that part uh, I think it's a big part of my life I see the the two as similar pursuits with different uh, tools pursuits for some kind of truth uh, and and for communication and sort of sharing and an understanding of the world uh, for me um, I guess I like both of them first of all uh, and then I really like the the process of creation and destruction and, and sort of uh, hypothesis generation, this wild chaotic time and, and hypothesis testing, which is a little bit more organized and I think the same happens in art. Uh, my name is Christopher Rodriguez. Uh, I have uh, two projects. One project is uh, my digital uh, exploration of painting. Uh, uh, this, this is a uh, Behind me is a planet uh, from my planet series. Uh, they're imagined worlds. Um, and I have a whole series of imagined planets that I created element, element by element on Photoshop. And, uh, and the second piece is uh, a virtual painting project uh, where uh, I'm uh, painting but without paint um, and um, using kind of low tech. Uh, uh, set up to uh, mimic painting um, and my, my practice is uh, it revolves around conceptual painting um, so I, I explore ways that paint can be redefined today uh, as it fringe uh, as, it, as it overlaps with different mediums uh, collage uh, drawing performance video uh, the, the digital image the idea of science is so broad, uh, so it's hard to not use science <laughs> uh, w within art. Uh, there's always elements of research, but a lot of art uh, 
uh, does comment, uh, make a comment, uh, a commentary on uh, the art scene in itself. So you're talking about the medium itself, or uh, or the art market. Um, but when the when you kind of break out of that uh, kind of conceptual practice and um, and touch on uh, social or political issues, um, science uh, com uh, is really um, extraordinary. Uh, Hi, I'm Aileen Penner. Okay. Um, so the idea here is um, it's a four-part sculpture. It's cement and plaster, and it's called The Weight of All We Know. And it's um, a sculpture that's meant to express a lot of the um, sadness and grief around a lot of the environmental science that I read about, including climate change, species extinction, and you know, um, oceans, um, uh, you know, farm salmon, all those issues that I've worked on and and read about and I'm passionate about. Um, you know, there's a sadness to to kind of um, understanding all about what's happening in the world. Uh, why use science as your inspiration? Well, I think that um, science is, is what's um, happening today. I mean, these are, you know, um, the tools at hand in a way. Like, science is a huge part of our daily life. And uh, particularly for me, I'm in interested in environmental science. And that, of course, is, you know, environmental destruction is happening every day. It's happening um, everywhere we go. So it's important for me as an artist to reflect that back. I do think the collision between art and science is important. I think that it's important for artists to reflect some of the ideas of science, um, especially some of the ones that are maybe not as um, visible or hard to make visible. Um, I think that there's a lot of science that's affecting our daily lives, everything from biotechnology to uh, pollution to um, you know species extinction biodiversity loss uh, all of that is is something that affects us every day and it's important to somehow try and reflect that back and um, I think though at the end of the collaboration at the end of the collision one of the things I've been struggling with is um, is it good art and um, my goal is to make good art and hopefully that's informed by science. Hi, I'm Willa Downing, and I'm in the uh, Spark exhibition right now, and my piece is right here. Uh, it's called Edges at Point, and it's a series of small um, drawing paintings that are all related to Edges at Point. And I was telling Eric here that, um, uh, <laughs> there's Eric, <laughs> Uh, he's another artist in the exhibition, um, that I was inspired by a series of um, booklets that I made. And this is one of the booklets from that series. It's called Geometry of the Real World. And these are all images and words that were cut out of a, selected out of a geometry math textbook, actually, a high school textbook. And I just idiosyncratically selected the images and, um, and words, uh, I found that the language, we were saying that, you know, technical language can be quite, um, well, technical and dry, and I, I think that they're didactic. didactic. And, um, but by choosing, idiosyncrat idiosyncratically choosing uh, words here and there, and uh, images here and there, um, I think the, the phrasing becomes poetic. So, for example, this, booklet, Edges That Point, is a phrase that actually came out of uh, one of these uh, little booklets. So these, these images then are inspired by the um, Edges That Point, that, mm -hmm. that uh, phrasing, uh, Edges That Point, what does that mean? Um, and um, I'd like to explore further geometry and poetry as different ways of looking at making sense of the world. And I guess that's why I like art and science, because they're two different ways of looking at the world. And the world is a large place, and we need different maps uh, to figure things out. And to me, art and science are really like different maps of the same coastline, of the same world that we live in. And the more, the more maps 
we have, the better it is. And, and um, I don't do art to illustrate science. Uh, I think that, you know, it's a, at a different level, that, at the meta level maybe, at a, you know, the level of creativity and, um, yeah. And that's why I like doing both, I guess. Hello, uh, my name is Patrick Keeling. What I'm standing in front of here is some woodwork that I started doing about 10 years ago. Um, originally I started off doing representations of micro, uh, microbial life and then um, I sort of worked my way up into abstract uh, representations of things that are kind of interesting for me as an evolutionary biologist. It actually started, I don't know, can you see this? It started with this picture here which is a picture taken from a page from Charles Darwin's field notes from the Beagle expedition. And he uh, just, he opened up a new book one day and he just wrote at the top, I think, and then drew this tree. And it was the first time anybody had really ever thought about life all being evolved uh, in a tree-like way, like things were related by descent. So that's a really powerful image, this, this thing here for, for evolutionary biologists. And um, I made a copy of it out of uh, steel as a coat rack in my office. And it got me thinking about how you do it in wood and blah, blah, blah. I eventually came to the conclusion that it would be really, really hard. And so instead I took the words, I think, and I translated them into binary and uh, made the binary pattern out of different kinds of wood. Um, so you can wear a piece of jewelry that no one would ever know this because it doesn't look like it, but you, you would know that it says, I think, which I think is just a really nice idea anyway. It's sort of like the opposite of believing things. So that's where I got kind of interested in this idea of encoding things in pictures that no one could ever possibly guess what it means. Can you talk also a little bit about your, the work inside? Oh, yeah, we also have um, some giant uh, pictures that we, we call portraits of microbial things. Where we use uh, the, the instruments that we use at work, scanning electron microscopes, but we take pictures of organisms, not so much for their scientific inf information, but just because they're really pretty, and zoom in on interesting shapes and patterns and textures and stuff like that. And then we've, we've blown them up really big and put them in these god-awful big gold picture frames like you'd see in some gallery in Paris or something. And this, I kind of wanted to try this because we have red halls in the, in the building at UBC where I work and it kind of looked like a picture gallery. So we put up these great big gold picture frames and the, the difference between the sort of what you expect to see in a big gold picture frame and what you get is kind of fun to watch people going up and down the hall because they actually do kind of sort of stare at it and go, you know, what the heck is that? Um, so we brought a few of those as well. One of my favorite organisms. Um, I know that you also work with Char on the Tintamarask. Can you Well, talk? really, that's all. I mean, Char, <laughs> this is all Char's idea. We, yeah. just, we just gave her some ideas of what kind of cells might be fun to do. And, and we suggested this one because it causes diarrhea. And we just thought that was actually really funny. And then it has two nuclei, the part of the cell where the DNA is. And so she thought it would be good to have this because so two people could stick their head in. Then the funny thing is when she showed it to us, we said, well, it has four flagella and it's supposed to have eight. So we came up with the idea that people could hold their arms and legs out and flap them and make it scientifically accurate reasons. Practically speaking, it's great to get people interested in science because it's really important, but people are kind of losing their, just their gut interest in science. They want to know what science going to do to make me more comfortable or more healthy or whatever, but it's actually more important than that, I think. So just reaching out to people and getting them interested in science is good and as a microbiologist that's really hard because it's so abstract but then i don't know i also just think it it's it's just it keeps things fresh just keeps us thinking about different ways to look at stuff it's just a way to make the science way more interesting uh my name is dan Degonye, and i am a hard, hard to describe I've been described as a renaissance man. I'm a mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, computer programmer, and also a robotics engineer. So, um, my part of this is a, uh, this particular model over here. Uh, it's a collaboration with Z Lewis, and we've combined my work, my technical skills, and my uh, development here of this robot uh, with her art being projected onto the material here. Uh, where my bot is actually at this moment traveling around on top of it. So, Well, they were putting out a request looking for somebody with uh, particular talents 
which happened to be uh, within my skill set. And when the project was explained to me, uh, being an engineer, I realized, okay, yeah, that that suited my skills. I'm quite capable of solving the problem that they were looking for. Um, as engineers were more into solving problems than the artistic factor of the whole thing. So it was easier for me to provide a solution that fit within their uh, parameters for the collaboration. So. In some regards, it, it's difficult um, because the artist uh, has to, they understand their own work and they understand how that creativity flows and their their limits are purely in the materials, whereas when it comes to engineering, um, there's substantial amounts of limits when it comes to both mechanical, electrical, uh, coding issues within that structure. So uh, they have a vision of how they would like to see the actual mechanical part, uh, whereas as an engineer, I'm like, well, that's not practical. It's, you know, we, we could provide this effect. And to me, it, it's solving a problem uh, to the best of my ability to fit within as close as possible to the vision they have of completing their work. So there's a preconception sometimes that art and engineering are two very separate um, fields of study when in fact they're not. Both of them require, you know, have advanced only through the efforts of one another. Uh, art using all the skills and technology that engineering is, you know, and inventions have designed and inventions using that ability of art to progress forward, forward with their actions. Hi, I'm Luke Blackstone. I'm, uh, I've been a, uh, a sculptor and a public artist and a, an instructor in art uh, for the last 15 years or so. Yeah, I'm including uh, in the show a piece called I Might Be Nothing. And it uh, uses the three states of water, ice, liquid, and vapor as a metaphor for the three states of being uh, while we're alive as human beings like all around us right now that we see but also the uh, spirituality energy uh, before birth and also after death so uh, just as a metaphor for the three states science I don't really um, um, mean to include it. it it's just another medium that I feel like I can express myself the best way by using um, electronics and uh, electromechanics and technology uh, just like a painter uses paint yeah I think there are definitely uh, similarities between uh, being an artist and being a scientist and the way that we're exploring uh, kind of unknown issues and uh, seeking answers um, uh, but in for different reasons, perhaps. Okay. My name is Eric James, and I'm from the University of British Columbia in the botany department. So as a biologist, I look at the symbionts that live within the guts of termites that allow the termites to eat wood. And without these organisms that live within the termites, the termites would starve to death. So when I started working in the lab, I noticed the form of these, these microorganisms was quite spectacular so I decided to recreate them in metal. So the sculpture beside me here actually isn't one from a termite but it's one that causes red tide. So if you've been heard of not being able to eat shellfish because of a red tide it's, it's due to a, a dinoflagellate that, that uh, causes red tide. Throughout my life I've always worked with my hands and being a biologist I, I like to be at the bench doing bench work so after I had worked at a lab, that lab was ending, so I, did, I applied to the Kootenai School of the Arts to go to art school. So I went to art school, I got accepted and went to art school for a year to learn blacksmithing and, and metal casting. And then I realized I needed to pay my mortgage, so I had to get a job back in science. And then working in, in the current lab that's, allows me to marry the two together to, to, to do the art and the science. Well, I think I don't picture the art and science as, as two separate entities. I sort of, I'm fortunate that I can, I can do both, the art and the science, so it sort of comes naturally to me. And I get this question a lot, is how do you do the science and how do you do the art? And I, I really don't have a good answer for that. It, it just comes naturally to me, so I don't see a distinction between the art and science. I approach my art in a very scientific way of problem solving and how do I how do I do something so I'll, I'll solve the, those problems within the art. Uh, Robbie Smith. 
Okay. Uh, can you talk about the work that you bring here to Spark today? Sure. So I brought two different uh, pieces from different series. Uh, these ones over here, the small ones, are collages that I made that uh, look at different species and our relationship with those species over time. And each piece um, talked about a different a different relationship. And then this big piece uh, is uh, looking at the interconnections between different species within the Salish Sea ecosystem. So our ocean ecosystem right here by Vancouver. Well, I think that um, in order to protect the natural environment we have to understand it and to learn as much as we can about it and the more you know about uh, different species or an ecosystem the more likely you are to protect it and so I use a lot of science to understand the relationships uh, that happen particularly underwater which we don't see um, very on a, on a day-to-day -day basis right and so science informs all of that for me. I'm not guessing at what's happening. I'm, I'm basing what I'm doing on science and that I think makes the pieces stronger, and more interesting. Uh, well, for almost my whole art career, I've had relationships with scientists in order to find out more about the things that I'm interested in. And so for me, uh, it's a natural pairing and I don't know what my art would be without science because it's such an integral part of it. Uh, your name? Okay, my name's Char Hoyt. Okay. Uh, the piece that you brought to the show. Um, the piece that I'm showing today at the Curiosity Collider is um, it's called the Cosmic Web Pathways. Um, it's a bit of a departure from my regular work in terms of style, but it's um, a piece that I wanted to explore because of the the early images of the gigantic universe. Um, it was so similar with what I was seeing of the, the neural pathways in our brain and, and it was just a wanting to show how similar um, the different things are on different levels of dimension. So the very large r reveal themselves to look just like uh, the very small things like neur neurons and, and slime molds or uh, the Tintamaresque. Now that one was just a funny idea I had in my head once I had seen them in a movie and then I was like, oh that would be a fun way to have um, a photo, people kind of interact. Um, and then it was like, oh well let's blow up a, a single celled organism, something that's very tiny and uh, have it be life size so people can get a sense of what it's like to inhabit this body of this little organism. And that's, a nut, that's something that I've explored in some of my artwork in the past, um, where I like to blow very single, very small things up to life size. I don't know, for me, art and science are so similar and can really inform each other in, in the best ways, and that Science to me is, is a way of understanding our world and our place in it. Um, it's like a, a religion to me in a way. It gives me a sense of meaning. It gives my art a lot more me meaning um, when I have science informing it. Um, it's also just opening up to different ways of understanding the world. You know, and, and seeing it on all different scales, I'm, I'm interested in that. Well, this was my first time curating a show that had a bunch of other artists. I've curated my own shows, but this was um, the first with collaborations and with um, so many artists and so many different media. Um, it was exciting, it was terrifying, <laughs> it was exhilarating. And I couldn't be more pleased with how it all came together. Um, I didn't realize that there were so many artists out there using science in their work in so many different ways. There, it's like an infinite amount of possibilities to have science influence artwork. It's, it, there's so many different possibilities and it was awesome to get 15 artists and scientists together and, and see everything that they come up with.